and it's really exciting to be here uh, and have the opportunity not to just share with you some of the work um, that my lab has been doing, um, but also a little bit about my story and, and how I uh, became a chemist. Um, so I actually uh, was born and raised in New Jersey, and that's a fact that I'm very proud of, but I also get a lot of flack for. Um, <laughs> and you know, growing up in New Jersey, it was, it was hard not to be aware of the large presence of pharmaceutical industry uh, across the state. And in fact, my elementary school was only a block away from our large uh, Sibagaygi uh, campus. Uh, and my family, in fact, uh, was very involved in the pharmaceutical industry. So my mother's father uh, worked in sales and marketing uh, in Pfizer, and he commuted into New York City daily to do that. Um, and my father's father uh, was the warehouse manager at that Siba Geige, um campus just a block from my elementary school. And so for me, um, I really saw uh, an opportunity um, for a career in, in chemistry. And so when I fell in love uh, with chemistry as a high school student, I really uh, thought I had a clear path. Um, so I went to MIT to pursue my passions in chemistry. And initially when I arrived there, I thought that since I loved chemistry so much, the obvious choice was for me to become a chemical engineer. Um, and with that chemical engineering training, I would be able to return to New Jersey uh, and seek employment at one of these pharmaceutical companies in, in New Jersey. And so that was my plan A. Um, and obviously, I'm standing here today um, not coming from a pharmaceutical company in New Jersey. So that plan um, didn't go as, as I intended. And that really uh, had a lot to do with the undergraduate research I did at MIT working with Dan Nocera. Uh, and that is where I fell in love um, with physical inorganic chemistry. So I shook things up um, and came up with a plan B and headed out to California after finishing my degree in chemistry um, to go to graduate school at Caltech. And I'd really like to say that it's the sun that brought me out west. Um, and it's not because I was moving to sunny Southern California, but really because I saw an opportunity uh, to work with Harry Gray and do research into the ways that we could use solar energy to drive the synthesis of fuels. And so that's really what my PhD at Caltech was focused on. And from there, um, I needed a little bit of a break from the sun, so I headed up uh, to the Pacific Northwest and spent about a year and a half in Seattle uh, investigating the magneto-optical properties of semiconductor nanocrystals uh, before heading back east to start my independent lab in Chapel Hill, North Carolina at, at UNC. And so over the last five years, um, I've had a really privilege to work with some tremendous um, researchers, and those are my young students. So when I arrived at Chapel Hill, um, I had three students eager uh, to join my lab, and so this is Robin, Thomas, and Eric. This is the first summer um, in 2012, um, and over the last five years, as I mentioned, I've really had the honor to work with um, a, a large number of tremendous students, and so they're the ones who have, have driven the work that we've done at UNC. And a lot of that work has focused on fuels. And so we can think about fuels like methane or methanol and hydrogen and recognize that, for instance, we can combust these fuels um, to release energy and uh, end up with some low energy products like carbon dioxide and water. And then this energy released is what we use, for instance, to drive our car. But my lab, we really like to focus on these low energy products and not think of them in that terminology, but rather envision them as feedstocks. And they are feedstocks to make these fuels. And so we can drive these reactions in reverse and start to think about how we can use carbon dioxide and water as inputs to synthesizing these fuels. We recognize that we need to add energy to get these reactions to go. And if we can couple these transformations to renewable and sustainable energy feedstocks like solar, wind, or hydropower, um, we might be able to essentially store the energy of these renewable sources in the chemical bonds of these fuels. And so oftentimes, I think all of us as chemists, when we try to talk to our, our parents or our grandparents about what we do on a daily basis, um, we might try to liken uh, the chemical reactions we're doing to something like Legos. So if I want to take water 
and make hydrogen and oxygen. I can say, well, I'm going to rip all the pieces apart and reassemble them in a different way. And those atoms are building blocks. So for instance, I might take my Lego castle, take that all apart, and then use those pieces to build the Lego Death Star. Um, but of course, as chemists in the lab, we know that's not exactly how these transformations take place. So looking at this reaction, the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen, what we need are catalysts that can mediate the multi-electron, multi-proton transformations that oxidize water into oxygen, leaving protons and electrons, and then another catalyst that can take those protons and electrons and generate hydrogen fuel. And these catalysts could be something like a heterogeneous material or a small molecule, like a coordination complex like this cobalt molecule here. And so over the last 10 to 15 years, this field of synthesizing fuels has really uh, grown tremendously. And researchers in this field ask some very important questions when they uh, develop catalysts. First, they want to know how fast are these catalysts making fuels? And they also want to know how selective these catalysts are for making the desired fuels. So are we making methane versus methanol? Can we make a single product selectively? And in my lab, we recognize that these are really important questions that drive the development of new catalysts, but these aren't the only questions that we need to be asking. And my lab is really interested in asking questions beyond that. We want to exactly understand the inner workings of these catalysts and how they facilitate these multi-electron, multi-proton transformations that take us from these energy-poor feedstocks to these energy-rich fuels. And in doing so, we recognize that those are proton-coupled electron transfer reactions. And we, again, we want to know exactly how those catalysts are orchestrating these transformations. And we believe if we can really gain insight into the inner workings of the catalysts, we can have the insight and the design principles that we need to develop better catalysts and the catalysts that might actually end up in the devices down the road um, that make solar fuels. And so these proton coupled electron transfer reactions, what are these and, and how are they important in these catalytic transformations? So again, looking at the example of hydrogen evolution, imagine that we have this catalyst, which I've abbreviated M here. Well, if I want to make a metal hydride, which is a key intermediate in many catalytic cycles, I can reduce that catalyst by adding an electron and then protonate it to form that metal hydride. And then that metal hydride can react with an additional electron and proton to generate hydrogen and regenerate the catalyst, closing the catalytic cycle. But that key metal hydride intermediate could be accessed in a totally different way. Perhaps I add a proton first and then I reduce it, getting to that same intermediate. Or maybe I transfer that electron and proton in a single kinetic step in what's termed a concerted proton-electron transfer reaction. And so there's many different pathways that we can follow to get to these same key intermediates and by which these same intermediates can react further. And so oftentimes the question is, well, what is the most, what is the best catalyst? Which pathway does the best catalyst follow? And so we can think about this and recognize that these stepwise pathways denoted by the edges of this square scheme go through high energy charged intermediates. So that you're necessarily paying an energy penalty to proceed through one of those intermediates. Whereas if you were to proceed through that concerted mechanism, there is no reaction intermediate between the catalyst and that metal hydride, inter that metal hydride product there. Um, but unfortunately, the process of bringing together the catalyst, the electron, and the proton often comes with a high uh, kinetic barrier. So even though there's no intermediate, you're still paying a large en energy penalty to go up over that kinetic barrier. But we know nature is able to orchestrate concerted PCET reactions, and so we know in the lab we must be able to design catalysts that can also exploit that energy efficient concerted PCET pathway where we lower this barrier to make it very favorable and at the same time avoid those high energy intermediates. And so my lab is really interested in understanding how we might be able to one day design catalysts that exploit that energy efficient mechanisms. But to do that, we first need to understand how these catalysts are working. 
And so in my lab, we really leverage two tools. We use electrochemistry and spectroscopy, and we use these tools to gain insight into the inner workings of these catalysts. And so I'll just give you a few highlights of, from research in my lab and some of the catalysts that we've studied. So these are two of the highest performing molecular catalysts that are kind of known in our field, this cobaloxime and this so-called nickel P2N2 complex. Um, and we've been able to use our tools um, to identify the dominant reaction pathways as well as get information about the kinetics of the elementary reaction steps so we know everything there is to know about each of these steps along the way. And so this cobalt complex reacts where the catalyst first takes the electron and then a proton and then an electron and then another proton. And this nickel complex can proceed through that same exact pathway. But in my lab, we discovered that if we can tune those reaction conditions, we can actually change the reaction mechanism that this nickel complex is going through and switch it so it goes through an electron, electron, proton, proton reaction mechanism. We've also learned exactly how we can tune uh, the reaction conditions or information, um, kind of uh, structural and electronic properties of the catalysts to speed up and slow down catalysis. So we really have um, an ability to tune the reaction kinetics precisely. And this is an example of some work um, looking at a uh, model system where addition of an electron and proton to this cobalt molecule uh, forms a stable metal hydride complex. And we found that we could tune the um, pKa of that substrate providing that proton. We could speed up catalysis, but then we hit a point where we couldn't go any faster. But if we used acids that had, were very sterically bulky, we actually kind of turned catalysis off or turned the uh, reaction kinetics down and, and dialed them back down here. Returning to that concerted pathway, we targeted this nickel complex here. It turns out that this nickel complex is a, is a terrible catalyst and it actually falls apart. But we studied exactly how this molecule was decomposing, and it turns out it doesn't decompose until like the third or fourth step. And the first step that this, reaction, that this molecule reacts via is a concerted PCET reaction. So this molecule reacts with a proton and an electron in a concerted pathway, followed by subsequent reduction, and then it falls apart. So we have been able to identify that these coordination complexes we can synthesize can go through that desired concerted pathway, and now we just need to harness this for a functional catalyst. So in my lab, we're still learning exactly what factors are, we're going to be able to use to promote that energy efficient pathway and how we can um, employ those design principles to develop these functional catalysts. But overall, by looking at the reaction mechanisms in such depth and learning everything we can about the individual steps that generate something as simple as hydrogen, uh, we're able to uh, gain that understanding that's going to lead us to those important catalysts that will transform our energy economy. And so moving forward, we're also thinking about how we may be able to integrate the light absorption with this proton-electron uh, transfer reactivity um, and really develop uh, catalysts for generating solar fuels. And so with that, I really want to thank um, really the people who uh, have brought me to where I am today. And I owe a lot of credit to my uh, research advisors through the years. And so this was an opportunity in, in 2010 where I got to be in the same room with my undergraduate advisor, uh, my PhD advisor, and my postdoc advisor. Um, and they have all been tremendous supports during my time in their labs um, and really continue to be incredible um, supporters. Um, and of course, my research lab, um, who's been in the incredible uh, group to work with over the last five years. Um, they're a lot of fun, and they are the creative young people driving this research. So with that, uh, thank you again for this opportunity, and I leave it with that. Okay.